Hi, how are you? I'm Anthony from Cypher House, and today we're taking a look at another listener crossword puzzle. This is listener number 4800, and its title is Ready Now by Eck. This puzzle released on Friday, January 26th of 2024, and solving this one was quite the struggle for me. This one had much trickier clues than the last one that we took a look at last week. I'm going to go over my whole solve process in detail, as well as my thoughts on the various aspects of this puzzle, so let's jump right into it. Solvers are presented with a 14 by 14 grid, and as you can see, there are no bars anywhere in this grid, and also no numbers. The clues seem relatively normal, they're sorted across and down, although, as with the grid, there are no numbers assigned to these clues. The instructions read, solvers must deduce the entry methods to fit answers into the grid. The length of the grid entry is given in brackets. Bars have 90 degree symmetry, but needn't be shown. In 12 clues, a word must be removed to enable solving. These words form clues to the forename and surname of a co-writer of a quotation. The letters immediately after the extra words spell a three-word phrase. The phrase's letters must be added to 12 letters in the grid, starting in the bottom row and moving diagonally to contiguous letters so that the final grid illustrates the quotation. Lots to unpack there. We are looking for a strange entry method as well as this phrase, a writer, a writer's quote, and we're gonna illustrate everything somehow in the grid. So definitely a lot to do on this one, but the first step, as is usually the case with listener crossword puzzles, is to just start solving clues. I put everything here into the Excel spreadsheet, and although the clues don't originally have numbers, I just gave them numbers uh, in the order that they're presented. So we have across clues numbered one to 24 and down clues numbered one to 24. Now, obviously when we start placing things into the grid, one across might not necessarily be at the same place as one down. Uh, the numbers don't necessarily mean that. It's just to give me uh, the ability to reference these clues and their answers a little bit easier without uh, having to just read out the entire clue every time. The very first clue that I solved in this puzzle is what I've called three down. It reads, stinker quite idle led union in part. And I don't know how I focused in on this clue, but when I saw in part, I thought that there might be a hidden word somewhere in here. So I was looking for things in between idle and led or union, you know, somewhere in that range that maybe meant stinker or stinker quite. And I couldn't quite find anything that really made sense along those lines, but I did notice that if I removed the word idle, because remember 12 of our clues have an extra word in them. If I removed the word idle, then hidden between the rest of the words here, quite led and union, is the word teledu. And according to Chambers, a teledu is a small short-tailed mammal which can give off a strong offensive odor. So I'm gonna put that in brackets and bold it. Um, we're gonna need that and we're also going to need these letters uh, immediately after the removed words. So I'm gonna color that differently to help us keep track of that as well. But the strangest thing about solving this clue that you might have noticed, and I did too when I first solved it, is that teledu, while fitting the clue perfectly, definition and wordplay, is only six letters long, and the clue indicates that it's going to take up seven spaces in the grid. Now, we shouldn't be too concerned about that because we do know that there is a mysterious entry method that we have to deduce in order to get clues into the grid. So I solved a couple more clues, uh, 24 across as well as seven down, are both, in the same way as three down, one letter shorter than the clue would indicate. I started to think, you know, maybe every clue is actually going to be a letter longer when it's put in the grid uh, than the answer that solves the clue itself. Uh, but then I started working on two across. Tight-lipped actor that chat show host recalls. And you don't see a lot of names in listener crossword puzzles, but they do come up every now and then. And the first thing that I did was start looking at chat show hosts because I thought we were maybe reversing a chat show host here to get a tight-lipped actor. And when I started researching into that, I found a very well-known chat show host is Oprah. And Oprah backwards is actually Harpo. Harpo Marx was an American comedian, actor, and mime artist. So a tight-lipped actor would actually be a perfect description for Harpo. So clearly while 
Many of our clues apparently are going to be one letter shorter than the number of spaces given. Uh, not all of them will have that be the case, so this is something that I'm keeping in mind as I start to go through and solve some more clues. I spent a good deal of time early on in my solve just trying to cold solve as many clues as I could, and I made some good progress. I found another clue, 13 across, that had uh, an extra word in it, um, but I was finding a lot of these clues really, really challenging to break into without any crossing letters, so I tried to make some progress on the grid as soon as I could, and once I solved 13 down, I saw my first opportunity. Based on roughly where I thought everything was going to go, I thought that this Y in hydrated was probably the same as this Y in Yucatan. So I started to fill in the grid a little bit based off of that. So if the Y in hydrated is also the Y in Yucatan, I estimated that that should go somewhere around here. And I wasn't sure which of these two cells above the Y, the um, H was going to go in from hydrated, but I was pretty sure that that meant the rest of hydrated was probably just going to be filled in below the Y. After I cold solved a few more clues, I decided to try filling in the grid with some of what I had. In particular, I noticed I had a lot of a crosswords towards the middle of the grid, so I thought maybe I could make some progress there. I had a grid where I filled in Yucatan just straight from the leftmost side and decided I was going to leave the last cell blank in that row. And the reason that I did this is because I realized that I could overlap it with four downs answer, which is trade gaps. I filled it in just like that. But somewhere around this point, I found I was having some trouble filling in more answers into the grid normally. And I decided that I should probably stop filling in the grid so hastily and take some time to actually think a little bit more about the restrictions that come with a 90 degree symmetric grid. I liked what I originally had for the outer perimeter of my grid because one and two across, as well as of course 23 and 24 across, completely filled their rows and I was able to do the same thing with down clues. I had one down, which was five letters, and 13 down, which was nine letters, being able to completely fill the first column. And similarly with nine and 22 down, being able to fill the last column completely. So I decided to try cross-referencing some of the across and the down clues in order to maximally use that 90 degree symmetry to try to fill in as many bars as I could. So I look at three across, which is six letters long, and I ask myself, if I were to put that at the very beginning of the next row down, would I have a down clue that I could put 90 degree symmetrically from that right here before the nine down clue that is the same length? And in this case, if we look at eight down, eight down is also six letters long. So I said, okay, let's say that three across is going here. That would put uh, 22 across, 180 symmetric from it. And then we have eight down right before that. Do we have a six letter answer that could feasibly go just to the right of 13? And we have a few down clues later on that are six letters long, 18, 20, and 21, could all feasibly come after 13 in this last column. I wasn't 100% sure which one of those was going here yet, but I was pretty confident that uh, we had placed this six letter answer. So we can try to do a similar thing uh, with four across that we did with three across and say, well, we know four across is six letters long, so it's not going to take up the whole rest of row two here. It could possibly go down in row three, but what would happen if we placed it all the way to the right side of the grid here and uh, said that four across was going to take up these six cells here? What would happen then? Well, 90 degrees symmetrically from that is just to the right of one down. So we would need to have a length six answer that goes in the second column here. But two down is what that clue would be numbered. And that's only length four. So we don't want to put our length six answer uh, for four across all the way to the right of this column. So we can go ahead and put a few bars into our grid to let us know that our answer is not going there. So I'm gonna do a time lapse here of myself going through the other deductions to fill in the bars of the grid.
Around this part, it starts getting a little bit harder to restrict things into the grid, so I start putting in the numbers for uh, some of the later down clues because that'll help get a little bit more info. So at this point, we know that 12 and 13 are both eight letters long and going across the two middle rows of the grid. Their down counterparts are five and 17, and we can't really get a ton of information from uh, just other things that we've placed in the grid because these are the only entries within their rows. But we know from the down clues, uh, because they go in typical crossword order, that five actually has to come between four and six in the top row. So we can't have it start, you know, somewhere further down. Five has to just directly go up there. And so we'll see what that's done is at the end of some entries, like one across here, we actually have two unches in a row. Typically that's not allowed by crossword puzzle construction rules. And it had me a little bit nervous when I was initially filling in the grid, but I just kind of assumed there was going to be some sort of uh, strange listener mechanic that would make it make sense later on. And that turns out to be true. Uh, but for the time being, I just left a double unch there and decided uh, that I would just be okay with it for the time being. So now that we've gone through that process, we see that we actually have a somewhat normal looking crossword grid, other than the double unches again that I pointed out earlier. Um, everything seems to mostly work, and so the question now is, do our answers fit into the grid? So here I started filling words in where I was able to. I of course started with Harpo because it was the same length as the space that I had for it in the grid. And then I went over to the one that I had looked at before, which was um, Yucatan and hydrated. And so I said, well, maybe the reason that there's two unches in a row here is that one of them's just not going to be filled in. So one of them gets the letter H from hydrated and uh, the other one is uh, going to be blank or maybe we'll fill it in at a later point. I was working under the assumption that letters would never conflict in the same space, that if two words crossed over each other, the letter would at least be the same. So for something like Teledu running through three down, I knew that 11 across is this S Dane. Um, and so we can't have the U from Teledu go there. So the U would have to go down here. The D could go in either of these two spaces here. I also have trade gap at four down that I can try to overlap with Yucatan. Um, and that works best if the A is actually there because the P can't go in Yucatan. So that means we can fill in the rest of Yucatan at the end. And we know that the gap has to come somewhere between the Y and the A. The G wouldn't work in S Dane if we had the gap there. So we're going to put the G there. And then whatever's above that is either going to be an E or a blank. But I kind of liked putting the E there. Uh, because that fits pretty well with the end of S. Dane going over here. Whenever I wasn't quite sure where letters were going, I started to fill in some letter options. So I wasn't sure where the gap was in Yucatan, but I said, okay, well, a U could go in the first space, this one could be a U or a C or the gap, and then this one could be the C or the gap. And so that gives me letter options for example for 15 down. So for five down now, knowing that it ended with this A and this G, and knowing that the letter beforehand was a little bit more likely to be a B or an O, I was then able to use that letter pattern to solve the clue for five down, which means we're officially solving an actual crossword puzzle. So now that I was starting to get some actual letters into the grid, I was having a much easier time with solving some of the remaining clues. I basically already had manicure and one step in their positions in the grid, so solving some clues was starting to become a lot easier. And a about when I fit one across into the grid and realized that for all of these double unch spaces in the grid, that's where I had my uncertainty as to where the blank was and where the remaining space was, I started to have an idea that maybe, in addition to the bars having 90 degree symmetry, maybe the spaces that we're skipping also have 90 degree symmetry. I had marked a yellow square that I thought worked pretty well between one step and stoop, and I started to wonder what would happen if I reflected that yellow square 90 degrees around to the other spaces in the diagram. It would put one here, and one up here, and another one over here. 
So after doing that reflection, I found it interesting that I had always highlighted lowercase letters, meaning while some of these words, in some cases a lot of these words, were already kind of cemented in, these yellow spaces always happened to be falling in positions that I hadn't yet cemented down. So that led me to gain a bit of certainty that my uh, skipped spaces are in fact rotating 90 degree symmetry just like the bars did. So I decided to try a similar thing with the next space that I was pretty sure was being skipped, which was here in Teledu. And I said, well, let's rotate that around to the corresponding spaces in the grid and fill those in. I didn't have any answers in those spaces yet, but this was starting to form a symmetrical looking picture. So I was pretty happy with how it was going along. And I think around this point is when I realized that there's a bit of a diagonal symmetry to the yellow squares that I currently have, as well as some other areas where I wasn't sure where spaces were going to be. So like these two yellow squares were along a diagonal and these two areas where I wasn't sure if a letter, you know, might be missing are also along that diagonal coincidentally enough. And I said, well, that can't be a coincidence. In fact, I think that all of our skipped spaces are going to be kind of along diagonal lines like this. So I filled in the diagonal lines that I suspected we were skipping spaces over, and I rotated that around the grid and filled in all my answers, looking for contradictions or things that made that idea not make sense, and it turned out there weren't any, that this seemed to make the grid actually come together pretty nicely. Clue six across, railroad devices worthless outside Long Island. And if you put base around LI for Long Island, you get B-A-L-I-S-E, belize, which is, if you look it up in chambers, a railroad device. So I was pretty happy that I solved the clue, but what you'll notice is that belize is six letters and six across is only length four. So unlike some of our answers like Harpo that just fit into the grid correctly, or the majority of our answers so far that skip exactly one space and are one letter shorter than where they go, we now have an answer that is longer than the space available for it in the grid. And that, that threw me for quite a loop. I had no idea what to do with that. Not too long after I found the answer that was too long at six across, that got my brain going that answers could potentially be too long, I managed to solve three across as well. Come into trouble dithering endlessly. Come into is the definition. Trouble is an anagram indicator, and endlessly is saying to remove the first and the last letters of dithering. Anagram what's left, and you get the word inherit, which means come into. And given the letters that we currently have in the grid, we are able to fill most of that in except for the I and the T. So I just decided to pair them up and put them together in the same box. I didn't know for sure if that's what was happening there, but um, that was uh, that was what I decided to do with it. Again, keeping up with the possibly everything weird is also rotated 90 degrees idea. Um, I was then able to solve eight down, assuming that the final space was going to have two letters in it, just like Inherit did for three. That gave me the answer positive. Uh, and we put an IF in that last space there. Eventually, I had all of the other crossings for six across, so I assumed the letters ALI had to fit into the unchecked space since it was the only option left. Later on, I managed to solve 24 down, and similarly, we have the letters RAY that could fit into that space there. Um, so I started to wonder if there were always going to be three letters in the spaces that I was marking red, and if perhaps there were always going to be two letters in the spaces that I was marking blue. This was just a theory, but I kind of liked it. I also noticed that it and if are both short words. Ali and Ray are both potentially names. After solving a few more clues, in particular 19 and 17 across, I started to realize that I was gathering a lot of these missing words, 
and in particular I was gathering a lot of these letters that come after the missing words. So as a reminder, these letters that come immediately after the extra words spell a three word phrase, and I have A-M-E-I-N-L-I-H-T. This is only nine out of the 12 total letters, but I figured that was enough to come up with a pretty good guess as to what the final phrase was. We know it's going to be three words. I liked something in something, and we have A-M-E and L-I blank H-T. So from this, I was able to sort of wheel of fortune the phrase name in lights, which has the right length. And so I was able to use that to try to guess where some of the other uh, missing words might be. So like we need an N from somewhere uh, up here, and the only answer that I hadn't solved at this point was four across. And I double checked everything else to make sure I hadn't, you know, missed an um, extra word somewhere. But from this, I was able to guess that can was probably going to be an extra word to give us the N. And I was able to do similar things for the G and the S uh, over towards the end of the phrase. After a couple of days, and yes, I do mean days, of attempting to fill in the grid, I finally had a grid fill that I was pretty happy with, and so it was time to start working on the end game. And the end game for this one was a whole nother day of thinking and figuring stuff out in and of itself. So we deduced the entry methods to fit answers into the grid. We made sure that all of our bars and everything else had 90 degree symmetry. In 12 clues, a word had to be removed to enable solving. These words form clues to the forename and surname of a co-writer of a quotation. So before we even get into that, let's take a look at those extra words. We have can difficult entering times render idle weekend recreation initially more savage. I don't know if it was intentional or not. I'm leaning towards it was intentional. The extra words in the across clues give the uh, clue for the first name of this individual, and the words in the the extra words in the down clues give the clue for the last name, and that's the one I actually solved first. Render idle weekend recreation initially more savage. I found a synonym of more savage is wilder, and I recognized that as a potentially viable surname. And it works pretty well with the wordplay as well. Render idle means anagram idle. Weekend gives the W and recreation initially gives the letter R. It's the initial letter of recreation. So wilder anagrams from W, R, and idle, and it means more savage. So I had a last name. It took me quite a while to come up with what the first name could be. The clue is can difficult entering in times. I ended up finding a lot of individuals who had the last name Wilder, and this one's a much more challenging clue. Um, but eventually, just looking up Wilder quotes, because I knew this person was the co-writer of a quote, I found only maybe a handful of Wilders who had notable quotes um, attributed to them, and one of them eventually stood out to me as possibly related to this clue. Uh, the the name that I found was Billy Wilder, and the only part of this that immediately stood out was that difficult could maybe be ill. Uh, it took me a while to figure out that times is by, as in multiplication, if you do this times this, it's this by this. And then looking up Billy in chambers led me to find that a Billy can is actually a thing. So can is the definition here and uh, Billy with ill inside of by is the wordplay. Billy Wilder is a filmmaker and screenwriter, which means finding the one specific quote that the puzzle is referencing turned out to be a nightmare because there are hundreds of quotes from Billy Wilder. Among all of the quotes attributed to Billy Wilder, I was looking for something on the shorter side. Just in my experience, I found that that's the kind of thing that these puzzles tend to be created after, and also something, I was hoping for something that was somewhat common, and so the one that stood out to me is hindsight is always 2020. Since I knew we were going to be adding letters later on, I was wondering if maybe all of the letters when added together would be 40 or maybe 20 twice somehow. 
I was hoping that we were going to do something like that to illustrate the quote of hindsight is always 2020. But I couldn't find any useful way to do that. I also didn't know why name in lights was the phrase that we extracted. Um, I didn't know what any of these extra letters in these boxes meant. So I was stuck at this phase of the puzzle for quite some time. It was, like I said, around a day that I was just stuck right here on this. And I realized that I wasn't going to really be able to find the quote without some more information, so I decided to focus in on the adding of um, the letters for the phrase name and lights to letters from the grid, because that's the next step of this, is that um, the phrase has to be added to 12 letters in the grid, starting at the bottom and moving diagonally up. And eventually what I noticed along some of the uh, diagonal lines that I had created here, I noticed that there were pairs of the same letter. So like here there's a P kind of on both sides of our diagonal line. Here there's a U on both sides of our diagonal line. Here it's an S. And this, um, this kind of confused me because I realized that I might have been a little bit too hasty with filling in my yellow lines that I was skipping over. I said, well, hold up, actually, this P could have gone either way down here. And it's the same, you know, up here with the B in both places and the W in both places. So my um, argument of this whole thing being 90 degrees symmetric couldn't even solve the ambiguity of which way uh, the P's should go on this block. I did notice that it wasn't the same over here. And for a minute, I thought that that cleared up the ambiguities and that I was in the clear until I realized that goose wasn't actually the right answer to clue 11 down. Goosey with a Y was actually a much better fit for the clue. So at this point, when the random thing that I noticed, the random ambiguity was actually fixing errors that I had made in clues that I thought I solved, that's when I realized that this wasn't just a weird ambiguity, that this was intentional. And uh, so I started thinking, you know, how am I supposed to wrap this up? How am I ever going to resolve these ambiguities? And what, as I was thinking about that, I noticed there's even more ambiguities. These two Ds could have actually gone in either direction. Same with these As. And I realized that the whole way along my diagonal line was actually full of ambiguities that I hadn't noticed the first time around. These letters could have gone along either diagonal, and that really confused me because I had thought I was getting pretty close to solving this puzzle, but this realization turned out to be really important because counting these uh, yellow squares, we see there's actually 12 of them, and if that number sounds familiar, it's because the phrase name in lights was 12 letters long. So I said, okay, maybe I'm supposed to start at this letter P down here at the bottom, and I don't know, you know, which square it's going to be in, I don't know where it's going to go, but maybe I start at this P and go diagonally up to the U or the S, W, or maybe I go the other way. Maybe I go P, N, F, Y all the way around this loop. That's 12 letters. Maybe if I add those to the phrase name and lights, I'll get something interesting. I did the addition in both ways, but it turns out the direction that we want to go is up and to the left here. So we add N to the A from name and lights, and that means we basically just take the next letter since A is one. Now reading in that order doesn't really get anything, but if we read these letters row by row from top to bottom, we get N-O-R-M-A, which spells Norma, and then D-E-S-M-M-N-D, Norma Desmond. Searching Billy Wilder with Norma Desmond gives the film Sunset Boulevard, where Billy Wilder was the director as well as a co-writer, and that's important because we know that Billy Wilder is supposed to be a co-writer of the quote that we're looking for. Norma Desmond is one of the main characters. So at this point, I started looking for quotes from the film Sunset Boulevard that may be related to Norma Desmond. Probably the most common quote that Norma Desmond says, and the one that I was most familiar with, and also the one that Wiki quotes put in bold, is the phrase, I'm ready for my close-up. 
And that uh, actually, to me, rings pretty close to the title of this puzzle, which was Ready Now. But looking through uh, the quotes a little bit more, another one from Norma Desmond is, I am big, it's the pictures that got small. So when I finally figured out that that was actually the quote that I was looking for, a lot of things started to make a bit more sense in this puzzle. After finding the quote, I learned that all of these spaces where we entered multiple letters are actually the names of movies. It is a Stephen King movie. Elf is a Christmas comedy. Up is a Pixar classic. All of these other ones are movies as well that I wasn't immediately familiar with, but you can Google them and If and Pi and Ran, these are all titles of movies. The pictures have gotten small. We've crammed them all up into a single square each. Norma Desmond, however, Norma Desmond is big. And when I realized that, that's when I realized just how much I messed up the initial entry of things into this grid. The phrase, solvers must deduce the entry method, was particularly vague, and it was vague for a reason. Um, the way that I went about solving turned out to be equivalent to what was actually going on here, but instead of skipping certain spaces and putting these letters along diagonals, the whole puzzle would have worked a lot better and fit a lot better with the final quote if I had regarded these four cells as one single cell. As you can see, test tube can now be read across the top row. Uh, Bluto, which is one of the other answers, can also be read. And Bologna can be read for column five down. Everything still works perfectly like a normal crossword puzzle. And in fact, there's no double unch anymore. Um, once you have this realization that you can merge these four cells together and just put a single letter on top of it. The final solved state of our crossword puzzle looks something a bit like this, but we should keep in mind that the instructions asked us to do the addition so that the final grid represents the quotation. So even though this is what the grid looks like with all of our answers in it, we should do that addition and change all of the letters in yellow to spell out Norma Desmond. And that is what is expected for the final answer for this puzzle. Now, for my overall thoughts on this puzzle, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was particularly challenging. A few of the other recent puzzles that the listeners put out so far this year have been on the easier side, and I've really liked those too. But it was nice to sink my teeth into a bit of a tougher one this week. I think that the differing entry methods are cool. I do think that deduce the entry methods is maybe a bit too vague, considering that, at least in my case, I found another pretty consistent entry method that um, just as likely could have worked. Now, obviously, it doesn't work as well with the final phrase and everything else that's going on with the puzzle, but given that there is another way that I think is more intuitive, in my opinion, <laughs> for uh, entering things into the grid. Um, I don't I don't really think this had to be this vague. I'm also really not a fan of how tough it was to find the final quote. I like the challenge of a crossword puzzle being getting into the crossword puzzle, figuring out the mechanic of what's going on, and then finishing filling in the grid. Once the grid is filled in, I'm really not the biggest fan of a really challenging end game particularly when I don't feel like the instructions have given me quite enough information to be able to approach the end game. These instructions, to me, make it feel like I'm supposed to find the quote directly from the co-writer, and that is got to be nearly impossible. This quote isn't even typically attributed directly to Billy Wilder. He, of course, was one of the writers for... Uh, Sunset Boulevard, but Norma Desmond is the one who actually says it. So in order to find this quote, you really have to search Norma Desmond. I, I don't really see how it would be possible for anybody to be searching Billy Wilder and to find this quote. So I think the instructions probably could have been tidied up a little bit, maybe expanded upon in a couple places in order to make the end game just flow a little bit better. From a constructionary standpoint though, I do recognize the impressive nature of this grid. All of these big letters are triple checked, I believe. 
that's a pretty interesting construction and really fun. And of course, also fitting in the movie titles around the outside makes it additionally challenging. I usually think that puzzles that don't give you a grid initially are more fun for me to solve. Um, I, maybe it's because I also really enjoy solving logic puzzles, but I, I like doing a little bit of cold solving towards the beginning and then treating it like a logic puzzle and seeing how much of the grid I can fill in from the clues that I was able to cold solve. It usually, when things start fitting into the grid, comes to a very satisfying conclusion for me, uh, not having anything in the grid initially. Um, so I really liked that aspect of this puzzle too, but that's just how I feel about this puzzle. Let me know your thoughts about this puzzle down in the comments section, and let me know how you're feeling about this series. This, if all goes according to plan, should be the second video that I put out on the listener crossword puzzle, and I'm hoping to do it roughly once a week. Um, we'll see if I'm able to keep up with that pace. It's been a bit of effort in these first two videos, but maybe I'll ease up a little bit and do slightly shorter videos from here out. We'll see. Either way, I hope that everybody has a great day, and as always, happy escaping. Bye!